I am Dan Wikis and welcome to Book 101 Review. Book 101 is all about the books that I read for the last 40 years and today I have my special guest. She is the author of Alice in Kindland, no other than Miss Liz Biller. Thank you for having me. Welcome to Book 101, Miss Alice. And can you please introduce yourself? Of course. Uh, I'm Liz Beeler, and I am, I think I describe myself as a work in progress. Uh, I started work as a financial services marketer, and then I, uh, I quit all of that after 20 plus years. Uh, in 2009, and I started voice acting and jazz singing, and uh, I did a little consulting on the side. I didn't quit cold turkey, and then uh, little by little, uh, you know, that became uh, work. It, that worked for me until the pandemic, and when the pandemic came, I had to uh, kind of rethink my my plan and I started writing and I had no idea what I was doing, uh, but I just started. And then I saw uh, an ad on meetup for a writer's group. And that really was the best blessing that could come my way. It was three other folks that were all writing novels. One of them was very experienced and had an Emmy. The other was a published poet and then there were two folks like me who, you know, did, we didn't know what we were doing, but we learned. And the group has been sensational. And uh, two and a half years later, I published my first book and I've got a second one underway. Oh, congratulations for your Thank debut you. novel. Thank you. How did you craft that Alice in Condolent? How did I craft it? Well... You know, uh, at the time I was living in Florida, which is a very unique place. And uh, I just thought people should understand the, the crazy mosaic of ethnicities, which I found really wonderful and funny at the same time. And uh, I thought they wouldn't, they wouldn't just believe it if I, if I told them unless I gave them the details. So that's what I set out to do. Um, it was at a time where we were hearing about unprecedented corruption in the news, really at every level of government and in our corporations. And I was disgusted by all of that. And uh, so that influenced me as well. And the story came together. I'm, I'm what you call a pantser which means I don't have a detailed outline when I start writing. I have an idea of the story I want to tell, maybe the beginning and the end, but I don't know how to get there. And I would just sit down every day and ideas came to me. And one idea would lead to the next idea. It was, it was kind of serendipitous how it would all work together. So a crazy idea, for example, someone in my group said, why don't you have a pool scene? I put in a pool scene, and uh, that's one of my favorite scenes. It's just fun. And in doing that, I had to bring it back to the whole story about fighting against corruption. So I had to weave that in there. And and uh, I don't know. It's kind of a magical process. The One idea pops into your head, and it leads you to three other ideas. And uh, at the risk of sounding trite, to me, it's divine inspiration. So Alice in Condolent, if you categorize it, which genre? Uh, I would say it's humorous literature. It's also been called women's fiction and Jewish comedy. Wow. <laughs> the, if, if there's a comedy in it, for sure, it must be good. <laughs> Thank you. Well, it makes people laugh. Yes. I love laughing, Miss Alice. So <laughs> I love As laughing. Do I. As do I. We all need it, right? Yes. So in the process of writing, what are the struggles that you encounter? 
Great question. Um, well, first of all, I didn't know what I was doing. So uh, it was just learning how, uh, how to craft a novel, um, how to consider each word that goes on the page. Uh, I had to do a lot of cleanup. I must have edited this thing seven times at least. And uh, how to create tension in every scene. It's really book writing 101. Um, it was a, it, for me, it was a glorious learning experience. I just loved the idea of learning something new. And um, so the challenges were developing the characters, uh, creating tension in every scene, having it all feel cohesive and leading toward uh, some sort of a, an, an ending that would keep the reader on edge and, uh, and making it well-written. So people would walk away and, uh, for example, somebody called me that I haven't been in touch with in years and said that she read the book and now she's going back because she's underlining the sections that really spoke to her and inspired her to take a stand against things that aren't right. And that was very moving to me. Wow. So those comments inspired you the most to write again another book. Yes. I, I love, now I love writing. I've always written for business, but business writing is very straightforward. You, you know, you, you have a who, what, when, where, why, and how, and it's very specific and there's no tension. It's just all leading you toward a desired outcome. Um, Books don't always go in a straight line and you want to have flawed characters. Uh, and, and so it's more complicated. But yes, I'm, uh, I'm, let's say, three drafts into my second book, which is a middle grade book. That'd be awesome. So in the future, what kind of genre do you want to specific to write? I'm not sure I want to be categorized quite yet. Um, I have two more novels in my mind. One is adult and is humorous after the second one. And the other one is a middle grade or maybe a younger book that's uh, just aimed at children and inspiring them. So two are going to be funny and two are going to be uh, just just aimed at, at entertaining children, but less funny. Uh, I'm always going to have some humor in my writing. I think life is too short and we take ourselves too seriously. And uh, it's just the way I think. Yes, let's have fun, people. <laughs> and exactly. love. <laughs> exactly. So why it's too late to realize that you are good in writing? Well, I don't think it is. Um, okay. I... I mean, I'm in my third career, and oh. I think the day we stop learning is the day we die. So um, I think when I think about singing versus writing, when you get up on a stage, everybody's checking you out. They're looking you over. If you get nervous, if, if you forget something in the moment, um, there's a lot of pressure, and it's it's more about your exterior than your interior. Whereas when you write, your book doesn't leave you until you're ready for it to go. And I have a, a greater chance of rethinking and revising and getting as close to perfect as I can. And nothing will ever be perfect. But uh, I think it's an ageless occupation and, and it's something I can continue to do. and learn and grow. And it doesn't mean I, I mean, yesterday I had an audition for a voice, a voiceover. So I won't stop those things, but I find the writing immensely satisfying. Very well said. So do you think writing is your passion right now? Yes, I think it is. I just enjoy it. It's very challenging and it's very stimulating. Um, it's like you've got, you're creating a giant jigsaw puzzle with your book and all the pieces have to fit together uh, and you don't know, you don't have the pieces when you start. So 
it's even harder. You have to create the jigsaw puzzle and then put it together. And you have to do that in a way that compels people to keep reading. Knockwood, so far, uh, that seems to be the result with my first book. Um, I've heard from folks from all chapters of my life that the book has meant something to them or they enjoyed it or uh, they were inspired to go stand up to something. And, and that, you know, that's, that's a wonderful feeling. Definitely. It's something that, oh, I want to write more. <laughs> yeah, no, I really, really enjoy it. Yes. So do you think Alice in Condoland will be a timeless book? Uh, time will tell. I, I don't know. Um, I didn't use dates in it. I guess the question is, will we always have corruption? I'd like to say no, but I'm guessing we will. So let's hope. Yes, definitely. So let's go to the reviews of Alice in Condoland the negative and positive review but so far I also all positive reviews <laughs> I had one lady who wrote meh oh okay and uh and she wrote meh for another reason why people liked it which is I used uh people's accents I spelled them out in the book which is not fashionable right now I took a risk in doing that but I felt that for one to really immerse themselves in this culture, one had to hear how people spoke. And, and to me, that was all part of the color and the humor of it is the accents. So that was a risk I took. Now, a professional reviewer loved that. So... You know, there's no saying it's right or wrong. You just do what feels right to you and you, you take a risk because then you're throwing it out into the world and people can be cruel. But to your point, so far, knock wood, um, the reviews have been pretty positive. Yes, definitely. But be, before we go on to our uh, reviews, I just want to invite you to listen to my other podcast, Food 101 with our third season with Chef Alessandro, one of the executive chef in one of the five-star hotel in downtown Toronto. And please do listen to my latest episode with Miss Al Wing, the CEO of Obli uh, Products or Obli Company. So please do listen, Food 101. So Miss Liz, uh, habla espanol. Si, sí, señor. Si. Sí. And one of the uh, reviews says, according to Andres Mata, recommenda su lectura ampliamente. As in English, is highly recommended. Wow. Era give, muy you, sí. give you five star. Muy bien, Miss Liz. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, why do you speak uh, Espanol, Ms. Uh, Liz? Well, when I was in the third grade, we had a choice of Spanish or French. And I thought that Spanish was more practical. And so I started then, and I stuck with it. And uh, I, let's see, when I, uh, in, in 1999, I moved to Florida to work in Latin America. So I was surrounded by Spanish-speaking people, and I couldn't have done that if I hadn't become fairly proficient in Spanish. And living in South Florida for 22 years, Spanish is everywhere. And it's um, South Florida is a very unique community. I know I'm changing topics for a sec, but you know, yes. when you speak a foreign language, it opens up your world. Uh, you don't just learn how to say yes, please, and thank you, you can connect with the culture in a way that you could not if you didn't speak a language. And so uh, in South Florida, different from other parts of, I, I really can only speak to the U.S. about this, but different from other parts of the states where I've been, people 
proudly speak Spanish and English and Spanglish and it get, gets mixed up. Whereas I've been, I remember going to a restaurant once in Chicago and I had a waiter who I was pretty sure was Mexican. And I said something to him in Spanish and he answered me in accented English. And he just refused to speak English, uh, Spanish to me as if there was something wrong with it. And I felt sorry for him. I, I thought that was sad that that was the way the society was structured, but not in South Florida. Spanish language is celebrated and that is wonderful. And that's another thing that I wanted to bring forth in the book. Uh, but I digress. I, I guess I, it's, it all started with a third grade practical decision. And I am very grateful that I made the right one. I think that would be great, uh, Ms. Liz, to write a book about Spanglish or other uh, culture of language. Because language is very important to learn, to connect the barrier. Yes. No, no, no. Go ahead. You go ahead. To learn the culture, to learn their food and everything. If they know the language, you can relate in everything, right? Absolutely. And that is, there are three levels to my book. The first is the obvious humor of it. The second is to highlight the, the depth and written, richness of the Latin cultures. And I say cultures because there's no single one. And uh, a lot of the folks in the story are educated or artistic. They're really multifaceted people who've had to flee their original country for you know, reasons that nobody would want to experience. And, and I think that in this country, we underappreciate the value that, that the miasma of uh, immigrants bring to us. And so in this book, I celebrated the various Latin cultures. Yes. And according to Miss Geneva Girl, a delightful read. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. So what are the elements that you put in the story to make delightful? Well, I think, uh, I think the heroine or the, the main character is likable. Um, I think the humor, making people laugh is, is a great, it's a wonderful thing. And a lot of people have told me that they, they read it in two days. They just couldn't put it down. So, you know, it's, as a first time writer, that's a wonderful thing to hear. Uh, and I think that Alice is fighting with her, her members of the resistance against outrageous corruption in her condo. And that's a very common thing, unfortunately, in condos in Florida. Um, if it, if it hasn't actually happened, the, uh, the unit owners suspected of happening. And people talk about that all the time. And, and actually you see it in the newspapers and you hear about it on TV. And uh, there was a, a case that made the national news recently out of, I think it's called Pembroke Pines. I think that was where it was, or Hillcrest. Anyway, a, a local South Florida community where the managers were stealing. I mean, it happens every day. So this resonated with people who've ever lived in a condo um, or anyone who's just disgusted with the corruption that's in our society right now. They all get together and they all fight back. And I'm not going to tell you if they're successful or not, because that would give it away. But, but I think we can all relate to universal struggles. And Def definitely. Yeah. C corruption is always everywhere. <laughs> Right? And it's disgusting. Um, and I personally have a really hard time dealing with it. I think that's also part of why I wanted to write the book. Yes. And I think that's the good idea. Thank you. So, so why did you choose Alice, the name of the main character? Because she moved from New York to this very strange new world. And... 
I, I think it was just a play on Alice in, in Wonderland. Um, this was not necessarily Wonderland. It was Gondoland. I just thought it was catchy. I think so, because the people will curious about it. It's usually Alice in Wonderland. Why Gondoland? <laughs> yes. Because it's just as curious. Yes. Of a location. Definitely. And according to uh, Hanser, it is uh, reviewed in the United States, I enjoy this delightful read. A Florida tale of characters and slice of life in a condominium. So how many chapters of uh, Alice in Condoland, Miss Liz? 27. So for all those 27 chapters, what chapters or where chapters you have difficulty of writing with? You know, throughout the book, I would reach a certain scene where I just didn't know what to do. And, well, there's one chapter that was particularly hard, and that is chapter 15. And that's, uh, it's called 1 Corinthians 13, 4 to 7. Um, and it's, if you look that up, that is a, a passage from the New Testament. So I, I use the New Testament, even though the character is Jewish. And it's about love. And uh, love is not jealous. You know, it's, it's this beautiful quote about love. And I actually use that quote at my father's funeral. And um, now I'm going to get emotional. But that chapter was largely dedicated to my dad and, and to the experience of his passing. So that was hard to write because I cried every time I wrote it, every time I reread it. Um, and several readers have told me it made them cry. Because if everyone, if anyone has ever lost a parent, they'll probably relate. Yes, definitely. Love is not jealous. Love is compassion. Stuff That's like it. that, right? That's it. Yes, it's a, it's a great verse in the Bible where everybody can relate. It's all about love, people. So, Miss Liz, can you be my guest on my Music 101 too? Because as, as you are a singer? Sure. Yes. And Thank you. Let's, let's talk about the, the, your experience as a singer. Who's your favorite singer? Who's your favorite band? And uh, at the end, let's talk about, uh, let's promote your book, Alice in Condoland. Okay. Yes. Who are my uh, who are my favorite singers? I think, well, uh, Frank Sinatra, Sarah Vaughan, Barbara Streisand, Ella Fitzgerald. Um, you know, I, I've sung all my life, but when I started to do it professionally, I studied the greats. And uh, there's a lot to study online so those are the folks that really inspired me i think esperanza spalding is another great singer um, um melody gardo i think is her name that's another wonderful singer so there are people that that continue the craft um i particularly favor jazz I think uh, in the uh, American songbook or even the Italian songbook or the Spanish songbook, but those classic songs uh, from the 20th century, they're timeless. They really, you asked about timelessness early, earlier. They really are timeless. The lyrics, the melody, the pacing. So that was my classroom. You it's one of, one, one of a kind. Yeah. So do you think in the future you will uh, write a book about music? Um, I wove some of that into this story, but music per se, it's, it's not one of the current ideas that I have. Um, it's funny, you know, when you say, how do you find your ideas to write a book? People have asked me that. Um, they just come to you when you're relaxed. And uh, so I have two particular ideas in my head right now that I want to pursue next. Music? Who knows? Maybe. Yes. It has to be an angle that would, somebody would want to read about that would be new and fresh. How did you come up with my uh, podcast book 101, Ms. Lee? 
I was looking on a site called matchmaker.fm and uh, and they had your podcast and I listened to it and I loved it. And, you know, putting a book out there, I went with an indie publisher. And so putting a book out there when you don't have a big marketing budget is challenging. And so what you do is give you give authors and readers an opportunity to hear and be heard. Uh, and that's a beautiful thing. And I'm grateful to you for that. Yes, because Miss Liz, this podcast is created to empower writers all over the world yeah. like you. So before we go on, I want to shout out to the people listening in South Korea. Anya and Sayo, thank you so much for supporting this podcast, most especially in Incheon. I got 93% audience share. Thank you so much. Seoul. Uh, North Chongchang, uh, Gyeong Sangbukdo, and Gyeonggi-do. Thank you so much for supporting this podcast again, because this podcast is created to empower writers all over the world, like Miss Liz Spiller. Yes, and Miss Liz, are you independent publishing or traditional? Uh, I went with an indie publisher, Three Swallies Press, out of Cambridge, Mass. So, uh, being an indie author or indie publishing, what are the pros and cons? Oh, that's a great question. Uh, the pros are that you you know you can, as a new writer, it's it's easier to get your book out there because I don't have. Uh, a following, you know, I, I'm brand new, right, to this craft. And so uh, my editor was actually became my publisher. And uh, it's a chance to to get it done professionally and uh, get distributed in all the right places and and to um, to get your first start. I think that's the pro. The con is you've got to do all of the promotion yourself and it is difficult to break through the clutter. It can be done and I am a persistent, optimistic person. And so um, folks like you give authors that chance, but it's definitely a lot of legwork if you do it through an indie publisher. So do you think in the future you will be uh, traditional publishing? I'll probably try. Uh, you know, we'll see what happens. Yes, because um, last time I interviewed uh, Mr. Clark, he's from Massachusetts, okay. uh, the the patient of a dead man trilogy. He did he did four uh, indie publishing, and then uh, the latest novel that he's describing when he went to traditional publishing. The distribution is more faster and more like widely, but well, it, it's up to you, right? Where you, uh, most of my uh, guests here on Book 101 Review, they are independent publishing. And mm-hmm. I think they choose to be, to be independent publishing, just like the author of Vail, he's independent publishing. He's saying that I choose to be independent publishing because some of this big giant publish, uh, traditional publishing, they, they belittle you. They're not giving you mm-hmm. the right money that you deserve. Well, I, you know, for them, it's all a machine. It's a business. And uh, you are a cog in their wheel. I think the biggest advantage of a traditional publisher is the marketing budget, but you don't make a whole lot of money. Um, On on the other hand, I mean, the marketing helps because you will get more volume. But my Three Swallies Press got me distribution just about anywhere books are sold online. And then I have called individual bookstores who have been receptive, uh, particularly in South Florida. So... I, I went with a publisher that I think was very professional, and I'm pleased with them. Um, and it is available everywhere, but it's not available at every Barnes and Noble. 
But, it, you know, when I called Barnes & Noble in Fort Lauderdale, they said they'd take the book. It'd be perfect for their audience. So it just requires a lot of time and energy of your of the authors to market the book. And uh, I'm spending months doing that instead of writing. Oh, okay. So that's the trade-off. So Alice in Condolan, what is the best highlight? Well, I'm going to refer to a, a, an African proverb that I used in, in book number two, which is, um, if you want to go fast, go alone. If you want to go far, go together. So for me, what was important about this book is that, uh, and somebody said this in a review um, on Amazon, it's about the collective power of the people. If we don't like the way our society is going, we can do something about it, but we can't do it alone. And I believe in that. I believe in, in collective power to right wrongs. And, and that's the message in my book. Yes, very well said, Ms. Lee. So they, so they think Alice in Condolan is good for a series or good for a movie? Well, I've been approached for a series. And the producers who approached me also talked about a movie later. But I personally see it as a series, say a six-part series. Yes. And... Uh, a lot of it is very funny, you know, and I think you, you teach a lot of lessons with humor and through humor. And that's another reason why I made it funny. Okay, sounds interesting. I want to see this in a series or a motion picture, Miss Alice. And uh, so do I. <laughs> <laughs> so do you think there's a sequel, a prequel of Alice in Condoland? Uh, somebody in my, uh, my book group wanted me to write a sequel and, and also some, one of the producers suggested the same thing, that there be multiple seasons. My, I'm open to anything, but I see this as a, as a unique experience at a point in time for this character. And I think to, I mean, if I were to make a sequel or a prequel, what would it be when, when Alice lived in New York? It's the same. It's not unique anymore. Each time she's living in some sort of a, either an apartment or a homeowner's association. I mean, that's the model of the story. And I think it loses luster. So personally, I think it's better as a one-off. Yes, definitely. Or... If you change your mind, it can be a trilogy or not. It's really end there. <laughs> you know, if someone wants to pay me an amount, an outrageous amount of money to, to, to keep going. I could. I, I just think that the bloom would be off the rose. I think it's magical in its current form in this unique community of South Florida, and I think the second time you read a story based on the first story, it's, it's not as unique or charming or funny. Yes. The, the story is end there. <laughs> as they I, I personally would like to end it there, yeah. So let's talk about the character of Alice in Condolan. Okay. Um, do you have a specific question or you want me to describe her? Yes. Yes. Can you describe the character? Sure. So she is an idealist. Uh, she's a very upbeat, can-do kind of gal. She gets into a rut in New York City, and uh, she has to fly down to South Florida for her work. And when she goes down, she just can't believe how beautiful everything is. You know, the, the fauna, the... The people, they're warm. She goes on this date, uh, or somebody, her cousin sets her up. She goes on her, a date with a charming Cuban, and he's just different from the guys up north. And she kind of falls in love with the place. And uh, then she goes back home, and she gets out of the airport at LaGuardia, and everything is gray. 
and then the buildings and her apartment building and the street, everything is gray. And she just really feels stuck. And she's in her late twenties and she's on a treadmill going nowhere and she wants a change. And, uh, she decides, just dawns on her. She gets stuck in traffic and an umbrella almost pokes her eye out. She says, I want to go. I need a change. I want South Florida. And so she moves there. She gets a transfer with her job. And, uh, you know, everything is just amazing. Yes. Her money goes further. <coughs> Excuse me. She gets a two-bedroom condo with an ocean view, which, you know, is completely unaffordable in Manhattan. And, you know, she thinks she's in heaven until, oh, and I'm sorry. Then she meets um, another charming Cuban and he becomes her boyfriend. And then three years later, he breaks up with her in a text message and she's heartbroken. And uh, then she finds corruption in her job. So here comes the corruption and uh, the corruption in her job leads her to quit because she can't handle it. She doesn't know what to do. And uh, she doesn't fight back. It's, a whole, it's just a corrupt enterprise. So she leaves. And she breaks out on her own. And she, like me, becomes a voice actor and a uh, jazz singer. But she's at home now. And now she starts opening her eyes to weird behaviors in her condo, weird activities. She goes to her first board meeting which for her is like a Broadway show. She would have bought a ticket. It's just the hysterical, the goings on. And uh, and me having lived in a condo really informed how I could describe these events because all of these board meetings are hysterical. My, um, my parents had a board meeting. After they retired, they moved to a condo in Connecticut. And I went to one of their meetings and they announced a $50,000 assessment and everyone listened. Nobody complained. And then they had like uh, beverages and little, little petty four sandwiches. And if you could see the goings on in a South Florida condo meeting, it's nothing like that. People are screaming and carrying on and they're arguing and they're all, you know, like fighting each other over the hermit cookies. And so, this to her is really funny, but then her neighbors try to drag her into some controversies in the building. And she forms some friendships and she's still healing from her breakup. And uh, that's when she starts understanding what's really going on in her building. And she and a band of, uh, of I don't know, band of family, they become family. Uh, it's a character is called Sherlock Olmes. He's the group's detective. He's Latin, so his name is Olmez. Um, Joanna Rivers, who's a feisty know-it-all who joins the group. She's not afraid to tell anybody what she thinks. And a character named The Champion, who's a lawyer. And she guides them as they do their research. And gradually, the whole building starts to learn that they see the fishy things going on. And they learn that these folks are meeting in secret not so secret. They're meeting in the coffee shop in the building. Everyone starts to want in and, and gradually her group expands to form what's called the resistance. And they are bound to secrecy because they don't know which side the different unit owners are on. And it's a whole, it's, it's a whole revolution. It's a, it's a movement that they have with the sole goal of overthrowing their board. The board come, gets on to them the board wants to, the board sends a spy to one of their meetings. Um, and, uh, you know, the board will do anything to win their next election. Anything. And so the resistance has to work surreptitiously. And uh, I don't want to say too much because that'll take away the fun yes. of the story. Yeah. Pilot alert. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. <laughs> so how many days or month you wrote this book? Took me probably three, four months to write the first draft and, uh, and then started the rewriting. You know, there's no such thing as good writing, only good rewriting. It is so true. And I, I rewrote it so many times, at least seven times. Uh, sometimes I'd get feedback from a, 
an agent who rejected me about you have to develop these characters more. So I'd go back and each time I learned something new. And that was really, it was a great school for me, this whole process. And I, I learned about developing the characters, uh, giving Alice some flaws because nobody wants a little Pollyanna. And she was not as perfect as she wanted to think she was. And she had some lessons to learn and uh, creating tension in each scene, tightening the language. So all in all, between when I started and when it got published was two and a half years. Wow. So do you think rejection make you perfect? Rejection made me better. I'm okay. far from perfect. But uh, yeah, each time you get rejected, you try to understand why. Yes, and it it serve you as uh, inspiration to strive better and better. I'm a pretty determined person. Um, you know, when I started voice acting, I remember a friend of mine who worked at one of the networks put me in touch with someone who, who did the voice for, I think, one of the um, Law & Order series, the, the beginning opening. And I spoke to him and he said to me, look, if you want to get into this business, you have to realize you're going to, he said, I recently, and I have a steady gig. He said, I went on a hundred auditions and I got rejected from each one. So can you handle that kind of rejection? You know, and to me, it didn't matter how many times I got rejected as long as I eventually got something. Yes. And that, that's probably how I look at life. So yeah, I mean, would I like somebody to, uh, you know, one publisher said we really wanted to do this, but we're not through it. We're not sure it's going to break through the clutter. And they don't want to take a risk. So, Definitely. So, no, it, it, it doesn't deter me. It just helps me to grow. So who are your favorite authors? Ah, I knew you were going to ask me this. Um Everyone says this, and, and I'll say this is the one who had the most influence on me, and that is Ernest Hemingway. Simply, I don't write like a macho guy. I don't mean that aspect. But his ability to say more with less is, is a goal for me. And that man can get so much out of five words, you know? Okay. Uh other authors that I really admire, um, Isaac Besheva Singer. Uh, who's the woman who wrote? There's a woman who, um, the woman who wrote A Tree Grows in Brooklyn. Betty Smith, I like her a lot. Um, Naguib Mahfouz, he's an Egyptian author. Uh, he's a prize winning author. And he wrote, uh, Palace Walk, and it's a trilogy. I really love his writing. People who can create worlds for you. You can immerse yourself into a situation you haven't experienced. I like that kind of writing. So if you connect them all in one word, what is it? I think maybe immersion. Immersion is a part of your writing. I think so. I created a a, a land, right? Condo land. And the reader may never have lived in a condo, but will really get that experience by reading the book. Definitely. So, Miss Alice, can you please invite our listeners to buy your book, Alice in Condo Land? Absolutely. Uh, it's available pretty much anywhere books are sold online. Uh, and, and that is both in the U.S. and internationally. Uh, and it's also available at local bookstores. If they, uh, if they ask their bookstore to order it for them, they can get it there. Yes, definitely. Let's support Miss Liz Biller because if you support her, she will give her best. Because uh, more, more, more to come, right, Miss Liz? Absolutely. You're welcome. And once again, people, let's support Miss Liz because Alice in Condoland is one of a kind. Something that you need to read to empower Miss Liz. Am I correct? And, and themselves. <laughs> uh, somebody told me that she underlined 
passages because it taught her that she too can speak up. <laughs> it's a, it's a book that you speak out, graph corrupt, graph and corruption. A little laughter along the way is nice. Always nice. Yes. So, Miss Liz, thank you for your time. Thank you for doing what you do. I would be delighted. Thank you so much for this conversation and、uh, for your podcast. You're welcome, Miss Liz. Morning, people. See you soon.